Thank you for joining us for this life-changing message from River of Life. If you are ever in our area, we would love for you to join us. For more information, click the link down below or download our app in the App Store under ROL Crawfordville. Now let's join our special guest as he teaches from the Word of God. I watched a video on YouTube, and it said if I did that before speaking, all of the nervousness would immediately (laughs) exit my body. It didn't work. (laughs) We're going to have some some fun today, Um, but before... Proceeding, I want to acknowledge um, a former pastor here in the church, Brother Al Terrell, who passed away last Saturday. Yesterday, we celebrated his life in here, and wow, what a, what a service. The Lord's presence just filled, filled this place, and Al was a, he was a hero of mine. He was a man of God. I know he was to many of you as well. And when I would uh, talk about Al, I would always describe how he prayed. He just seemed, didn't. He was just gifted when it came to praying. I've never met a man who could pray like Al Terrell. And I've watched him walk into a situation or a room or when somebody needed prayer. And it was, it was like he could take a hold of that situation in his left hand. And with his right hand, it was like he could reach up into heaven and just pull heaven over that situation and pray with such power and authority. And I was so jealous of how he, how he could pray. And I would ask him on multiple times, I'd say, oh, you got to teach me how to pray like that. And he would always look at me and same thing. He replied it the same way every time. He'd always look at me and grin and just say, son, just keep practicing. Just keep practicing. <laughs> And so the reason I bring him up is Brother Al truly uh, exemplified what I'm going to be talking about this morning. Also, thank you, Pastor Coburn, for allowing me to, to speak today. And uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Kyle Jones, and I am not a preacher, and I'm not a pastor, and I'm not on the church staff. I'm just an ordinary guy who has attended this church for 20 years, a little over 20 years, and I'm an usher. So you usually will see me working with the usher team in the back, helping people uh, get seated. But I am uh, just an ordinary man. I love the Lord, and I love this church. And, you know, the Lord's purpose, the Lord's design, is not just to work through the preachers, the teachers, the church staff. His purpose, his intent is to work through each of us, to work through each of you, to glorify his name and to glorify his kingdom. So that's why I'm up here today. And so I guess we need to go ahead and get one other, one other thing out of the way. I am the son of Henry Jones. (laughs) and almost weekly I hear literally almost weekly I hear that my mannerisms are like his I hear that my voice is like his and worst of all you know what's coming people tell me I look like him (laughs) And uh, I even had someone standing right back here not too long ago look at me. Serious. They weren't joking. And they said, are you in the pastor brothers? <laughs> can, you, can, you believe, can you believe that? So, um, 
You know, when I hear all of those comments, the same expression comes to my mind every time I hear it. And it's that old expression, we all have our crosses to bear. (laughs) And I guess that's the cross that I have to bear as I walk through this life. Obviously, uh, I'm joking. Uh, The truth is, I grew up in a home with a... I'm going to try not to get, get choked up this morning, so y'all, be, y'all, be, y'all be with, bear with me. But I grew up in a home uh, where I saw a mom and a dad every day pursuing and chasing after uh, the Lord. Uh, there was very seldom, and my mom's on the front, front row, very seldom did I get up in the mornings when I didn't see her Bible out in, open and open on the kitchen table. And my dad was a strong leader, all of you know that. He's a strong leader, always has been. Actually, was a lot probably meaner and stronger back then. (laughs) But but, uh, I saw my dad humble himself before the Lord as a young young boy and weeping and crying and worshiping and going after God with all of his heart. And I'll tell you, there's no greater gift that you can give a family member or loved one than for them to see you seeking after the Lord, to see you humbling yourself after the Lord. And you may, you may think I'm too old. My family would think I'm crazy. My kids are grown. No, no, no. If you have breath in your lungs, I challenge you. It's not too late. If you care about the people around you, let them see you seeking after the Lord. Let them see you humbling after the Lord. And, and if you do that, if you do that, you will change the destiny of your family. I promise you. So uh, before, before I get started. I'm also reminded of a man by the name of Brother Bill Daniel. Many of you know him. He's since gone on to be with the Lord. Uh, Brother Bill Daniel was a, um, he was an attorney in Tallahassee. Uh, I think he served as a judge for a while. He had several high level degrees. He was very, very well respected in the business community in Tallahassee. But there's one thing that he loved more than anything. His passion was sharing the gospel. And uh, he shared the gospel passionately until the day he died. Oftentimes what he would do on his lunch breaks with a suit and tie on, he'd go down, he'd get on the street corner, and he would start witnessing to people. He would, unashamed, no matter how he, even though he was highly regarded, He was unashamed of the Lord, and he loved sharing the gospel. In fact, he told me one time, he said, Kyle, you'd be surprised how many people you can lead to the Lord if you just ask them. And and I distinctly remember a time, and he was not a preacher, by the way. Uh, He was just a layperson. But um, he stood in this pulpit and preached the gospel. And uh, you remember it, and this whole altar filled with people giving their heart to Christ. Unbelievable. What I think Brother Bill did, though, what he had a very distinct keenness about, what he knew, and he tapped into this, and this was his secret. He knew that if he could engage the Holy Spirit, he knew that if he could get the Holy Spirit involved, that great things were possible. Anything could happen. So, I'd like for you to do something with me. I want everybody in the house to repeat after me. You ready? Okay, so repeat after me with enthusiasm. Okay, ready? Lord, I believe your word. word. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. God. Come, Come, Holy Spirit. Bow with me in prayer. Dear Lord, I pray that through your Holy Spirit, There will be salvation, deliverance, comfort, and healing and revelation in this house today. I pray that today will be a new beginning for many. And I pray this in the name of, above all names, the name of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So the title of my message today is uh, Something Better. Something Better you got to have a good title to a message, and that's a pretty good title, don't you think? Something Better. And our passage will be out of Matthew chapter 6, uh, verses 31 through 33. And uh, while we're getting ready to pull that up, you know, one of the things what's awesome about this church, and I've been meaning to say this, I've been wanting to say this for a long time, but it is the diversity that we have at River of Life. We have... 
we have people from all different ethnic backgrounds. We have people from different races. We have people from different denominations. And we have people from all different walks of life. We have some people in in here today that can't even remember the first time they went to church. They have served the Lord faithfully their entire life. They've never strayed from them. And then we have other people that this may be their first time attending. They may have never served the Lord. And, uh, and, and so we've got people at all different walks and where they are. And I, I, I love that about this church. And in this church also, I guarantee we have people are going through all different types of challenges. You name it, there's people going through it sitting in this house uh, today. And, and I love that diversity. I think it makes us stronger. There is one thing, though, in spite of all of the diversity, in spite of all of the differences, we all agree on without compromise. And it is that the Bible is the infallible Word of God and truth. And we stand on what the Bible says regardless of what the world says, even if it's not politically correct. And I love that about River of Life. So even though we're in a diverse crowd today, all different levels, all different levels, what I'm going to talk about is going to apply to you. Every single person in this house, what I'm going to talk about this message is for you. So uh, let's uh, read the text. Matthew 6, 31 through 33. Therefore, do not worry, saying, What else shall we eat? Or what else shall we drink? Or what else shall we wear? For all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first, seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. This passage is, many of you are familiar with it. We've been going through, uh, uh, Derek's been taking us through Sermon on the Mount teaching for some time now. We all know this is from the Sermon on the Mount. This is Jesus teaching to a large crowd where we believe would be somewhere. He was on a hillside in what would today be the northern part of Israel. And to say these were hard times for the Jewish people would be an understatement. They were under the oppression of the Roman Empire, literally just to make ends meet was a struggle. They literally didn't have trouble putting food on the table and finding the clothes to wear and even getting, getting water. And, and here you have Jesus standing in front of them. Think about it, really. There's not one person in here today who doesn't know where they're going to get their next meal from. But here you've got Jesus standing in front of these people saying, hey, don't worry. Don't worry about where you're going to get your next meal. And you know, I thought about that. I'm a dad. I've got kids. I feel like I need to provide for my family. And if I couldn't feed my family and somebody standing in front of me saying, hey, don't worry about where you're going to get your next meal. Where are you going to get your, your water? Where are you going to get your clothes? That would be tough. That would be tough for me to embrace that. And here Jesus yet is standing in front of the Jewish people saying, don't worry about those things. I'm going to tell you how to get something better. I'm going to tell you how to get something more. And it's to seek God first with all your heart. And God will take care of everything else. And, I can, and while Jesus is speaking, it's easy to read that, but if you really put yourself in the audience, that's tough. That'd be tough to embrace that. It'd be tough to accept that. And I can hear Satan whispering in their ear, you're never going to get out of this situation you're in. It's never, going to get, it's never going to get any better. Don't listen to that man. He doesn't know what he's talking about. But Jesus did know what he was talking about. And he was telling them there's something better. There's something more, and I'm going to tell you how to get it. But you know, there were also other people in the crowd that day. The bulk of the crowd were hurting and were impoverished, but there were also probably some scribes and Pharisees in the crowd that day. Those were the upper level of the Jewish society. There were probably some Romans and some Roman officials because they were always trying to catch Jesus and, and doing something. So I'm sure they were, they were there. But, you know, his message applied to them as well. And he was saying, hey, there's, there's something better. There's something more for you than what you got. And I can also hear Satan whispering in those scribes and Pharisees' ears, hey, 
Look at what God's already doing in your life. You're well off. You're good. Look at what you're already doing for the temple or for the church or for, uh, for the kingdom of God. You don't, need to, you don't need to listen to that man. But there was something better. And Jesus was telling them, there's something more. There's something better. And I'm going to tell you how to, to get it. So, speaking of something better, something better. You know, if any, you spend any time on the internet, we're inundated with little things that make our life, try to make our life better. And I call them life hacks. You, you see this when you get on the internet when you're scrolling? All kinds of life hacks. And basically a life hack is anything that will make your life better, anything that will make your life easier, anything that will help you accomplish something faster, maybe a shortcut, a shortcut to something. Did you know there's, there's one out there, there's a specific breathing exercise that says if you'll get up and go through this breathing exercise every morning, you'll add seven years to your life. There's another one that says if you go barefooted outside on the bare earth, like when your bare feet touch the earth, that it actually neutralizes your body. Something chemically actually happens in your body, results in an increase in red blood cells, and I guess that's a good thing. When you have more red blood cells in your body, all kinds of good stuff happens. There's also one that says if you'll take an ice bath, they call it a cold water plunge. Have y'all heard this? Have y'all heard about the cold water plunge? If you get in, if you get in a cold water plunge, at, they say three minutes a day, has enormous health benefits, so they say. So it'll help your brain and immune system and all this kind of stuff. And the list goes on and on and on. There's even one I saw that if you, I'm going to actually do this one. Uh, it says if you eat two carrots a day, it'll make you more tan. <laughs> so I, I'm going to start eating two carrots a day. Oh, by the way, if you run across one that says... Making a fool of yourself in front of an audience by exercising will, will help the nervousness leave your body. I promise you that one. Huh? Don't, don't pay attention. Don't pay attention to that one. It doesn't, it doesn't work. Reason I say all of that is could it be that in God's word, he has given us the greatest life hack of all time. And it's been right in front. It's right in front of us. Seek God first. Seek God first. Could it be that simple? And if someone were to ask me, so Kyle, you mean to tell me that if I were to seek after God first, that that would be the solution to all my problems? And I would respond to them, absolutely, yes. Without hesitation. But not in the sense... That it's going to make all your problems go away. The truth is, you may not be in a flood right now, but the floods will come. You may not uh, be, feel like you're drowning right now, but sometimes the rivers are going to feel like they're consuming you. And part of being human, part of walking this earth is sometimes we're going to walk through the fire and we're going to feel the pressure of earth on uh, the pressure of this life on us almost beyond what we feel like we can bear. Don't let any preacher, any teacher tell you otherwise. That's just a reality of walking this earth and being human. But in the 43rd chapter of Isaiah, his word says, I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And the rivers will not sweep you away. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. And when he is with you, there is nothing better. Nothing better. Nothing, at least on what this earth can give you. There's nothing better in this life than when he's with you. And Satan wants whatever it is you're going through. He wants it to consume you. He wants it to dominate your thoughts. And he wants you to think that there is nothing better than what you're going through. You know, I'm not going to go into any specifics. 
But one time my, I, had a, I was going through something and my, my heart was aching. My heart was hurting so bad. I, I felt like a failure. I felt like there was just so many things going on. I, was about, I felt about as low as I've ever felt. I really felt helpless. And this, uh, this experience um, was actually the inspiration for me in, in this message. But uh, I, this went on for, for several days. And it was just constantly on my mind. I couldn't eat. I couldn't sleep. When I'd lay in bed, you know, when I'd wake up in the morning, it was just there. I couldn't get my mind, couldn't get my mind off of it. And I was laying in bed one night, and, and something clicked in me. And um, I said to myself, you know, I'm a child of the king. And what I have to look forward to is bigger and greater than this adversity. And I began worshiping him. And I began seeking after the Lord. And I can't explain and I can't even do it justice. And some of you Christians out there who are a lot more mature than I am, I'm, I know you can do a better job than what I'm, I'm doing. But you know what I'm talking about. But then something miraculous happened. And that knot that I had in my chest for days and days and days, that was just consuming me with worry, all of a sudden it started to fade a little bit. And then I started to feel that joy of the Lord take the place of that. And then I, all of a sudden, I had joy in my heart that I can't, it does it makes absolutely no sense. But many of you know exactly what I'm talking about. He took that pain, he took that knot out of my chest and, and he replaced it with his, his presence and his joy and his comfort. And the reality was, you know, that adversity, by the way, the adversity didn't go away. It was still there. Didn't change one bit. I still had to go through that situation. But what he did, what the Lord did, he gave me something better when I needed it the most. But it doesn't stop there. You may not be going through an adversity. You may be, you may be walking. I know many of you are walking so close with the Lord right now. I look up to so many people in this, in this body, in this church. You may have no adversity in your life right now. You may be walking as close with Christ as what you feel possible. Things may be great in your life. But there's something more for you too. There's something more for you too. And I, let me tell you a trick. Let me tell you what Satan will do. If Satan can't destroy you, he'll try to block you from moving forward, moving any further forward. And if he can convince you that it's not possible for you to walk any closer with the Lord or that there's nothing more for you in the Lord. That's a, that's a trick of the enemy because there is. There is always, always, always something more and there's always something better. You see, it's impossible to ever reach a point where you can't grow closer to the Lord. It's impossible to ever reach a point where there's nothing, where there's nothing more. No matter what stage you're at, no matter what stage we're at. And I want you to try to remember this if you can take anything out of this message today. But we should be seeking Him with all of our heart. With all of our heart. And when we seek Him, we will find Him in ways that we never felt possible. And, and when we find Him, we will begin to know Him. And here's the key. He'll begin to know us. When we find him, we'll know him. He'll know us. And then we'll, be, and then we'll begin a love with, our, with the Lord, with our Savior. That when that happens, and it will continue to grow and build, and you'll be able to do things for the kingdom that you never thought possible. So no matter where we're at, no matter where you're at, our ongoing pursuit, ongoing pursuit, no matter where you're at, is to seek him, to find him, to know him, and to love him. Seek him, find him, know him, love him. Everybody agree with that? Does that sound good? But, but here's the problem. There is a big problem. And um, I love Walcala County. This, I tell you, Dad moved us all around the southeast when I was growing up. And 
I st- I, I, he took us out of Wakulla County for a while, and when we moved back, I tell you, Wakulla County, I don't think there's a better place to live in air- anywhere. But if you were to poll everyone in this county and ask them, they would tell you they love the Lord. I bet 99.999% of the people in Wakulla County would tell you they love the Lord. But I question, I wonder if they really love the Lord the way the Lord expects us to love Him. I really question whether the vast majority of people love the Lord the way He deserves to be loved. I wonder if the vast majority of people really love the Lord in a way that makes the Lord want to take us to be one of His his children. I don't know. You know, Billy Graham... Once said, I was, a, I was a little toddler, I think, when, when Billy Graham said this. Some of you may remember it. But on national TV, Billy Graham made a statement one time. He estimated that 85% of church attendees were lost. Many of you may remember when he made that statement. He fell under great criticism and great scrutiny when he made that statement. And, uh, you know, and, and I, think, I think this is why he may have said it. We'll know. We can ask him one day. But, you know, you can't really love, if you really think about it practically, you can't really love the Lord with all of your heart if you really don't know him. How can you love the Lord if you don't know him? And you can't know the Lord, and he'll never know you if you've never, if you've never really found him. Or if you've never really met him. And most likely, most likely, you will never find the Lord if you don't seek after him with all of your heart. And um, so, you know, I don't know. And that's really been on my my heart. And by the way, and there's a lot of scripture that that back that up. Uh, Let's talk about seeking. So seeking after the Lord. Um, As I wrap up, I want to talk about kind of what seeking is or what looking for something is. Everybody knows, I, I love, that knows me, I love the deer hunt. That's probably my favorite thing to do. My favorite hobby is probably, is probably deer hunting. And uh, a couple of years ago, where we hunt, there was this one particular buck. Now, it, now, we got some great hunters. We got some great hunters in here, and I know who you are. But if you're really going to hunt after a trophy buck, it takes a lot of work. And you got to seek after him. And there was a buck on our property. And I had, I knew every nook and cranny of the property. I actually had 12 cell cameras. And you guys know what a cell camera is? So a cell camera, you can take these cameras now and you can put them out. And it'll take a picture when something walks in front of it. And it'll come straight to your cell phone. I had cell cameras all over the property. I knew the property. I put my 100% effort into it. Did everything within my power to try to find to find that buck. And this went on and on and on and on. And you know what? I never made it happen. Never could make it happen. And in spite of all of my effort, in, fa- in, in spite of all of my energy, I came up short. When it comes to... Let me t- talk to you about seeking after the Lord, though. When it, when it comes to seeking after the Lord... We have several promises in Scripture. In Jeremiah 29, 13, it says, You will seek me and find me when you what? Search for me with all of your heart. Matthew chapter 7, verse 7, it says, Keep on asking and you'll receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking and you'll find. Keep on knocking and the door will be open." I'm just an ordinary man, but I promise you, I promise everyone in here, we have a promise in Scripture that if you seek after the Lord with all of your heart, you'll find Him. It's a guarantee in Scripture. So, with all of your heart, let's talk about that for a second, because words can be kind of tricky. So what does that mean? And I was really trying to to think, how could I get this point across with all of our heart? What does that, what does that really, really mean? To seek Him wholeheartedly. And um, 
she's going to kill me for doing this. <laughs> but, um, but if the sound booth could pull up a picture. So, that is a picture of me and my wife, Susan, 21 years ago on our wedding day. Isn't she beautiful? <laughs> I was, I was, uh, I may get in trouble here. I was 28 and she was 26 when that picture, uh, when that picture was taken. And, um, uh, and I'm going to talk about this in just a second. But I, I got to hit the timeout button. Can I hit the timeout button real quick? Can I, can I step away from my message? Because the truth is I may never get this opportunity ever, ever, ever again. So you got, what's that old saying? You got to seize the opportunity. You got to seize the opportunity when, with, yeah, yeah, that's right. So everybody knows, everybody knows uh, Travis Perez in the church. Don't you? Most, most everybody know Travis? Scooter. You know Scooter? So Scooter and I, he's one of my best friends. And he's my prayer partner. And we truly are blessed to have Scooter in the church. And he's such a, such a blessing and such a great man of God. You know it's coming. But he's always bragging to me about how great of a husband he is. And he is always telling me, I took Cynthia here. I took Cynthia there. I did this for Cynthia. I love Cynthia so much. I just hear this constantly. And although he's never really come right out and said it, I think that he thinks that he's a better husband than me. <laughs> so this is my chance to kind of one-up him. And today, I don't know if everybody can see it, but I want to show y'all something. <laughs> That's right. So today, I think I'm the winner. For those of you who couldn't see, that was my bride on my socks. Picture of my wife. I t and I can just take her wherever I go right here. Forget, forgive me, brother. I bet, you know, I had to do that. Now, let me, let's get back to this. So that is the actual, that's the actual wedding picture of Susan and I. Um, but everything I say from this point forward is, is not true. Everything I'm going to say here is made up. We're going to play the, the what if game, right? Is everybody clear? This is the what if, what if game, or I'll end up getting a divorce if, <laughs> if I don't make that really clear here. We're going to play the what if game. So 22 years ago, when I proposed to Susan, and I asked her to be my wife, what if Susan had said to me, yes, I want to be your wife. I love you so much. I want to spend the rest of my life with you, and I love you more than anything. But, 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 but you know what, though? There's this, uh, back in high school... I had this boyfriend named Bill. And you know, I don't like Bill as much as I love you, because I love you more than anything. But just a few, few days out of the year, I want to go spend some time with, with Bill after we get married. It won't mean anything, because I, I love you more. And, and, and I love you more than anything, and I'm going to be dedicated to you. But just a few days out of the year, I want to go go spend, some, spend a few days with Bill. And then she said, oh, and by the way, when I was in college, uh, I dated this boy named Jack. And you know, Jack, uh, I, I don't even like Jack nearly as much as I love you because I want to be your wife. I love you more than anything. I'm dedicated to you. I'm going to dedicate my life to you. But a few days out of the year, I want to go spend a few days with, uh, with Jack. In fact, what if you were to say, you know what, on, uh, 
even on Sundays and Wednesdays, I'm going to especially love you more. Every Sunday and Wednesday. But just a, just a couple days out of the year, I want to go spend some time with, with Jack. I think everyone in the church would know how I would have responded. The, the, truth, the truth is, no matter how much I love Susan, no matter how much I wanted her to be my wife, no matter how much I wanted her to be my bride, I would have not allowed her to be, I would not have taken her as my wife. I would not have taken her as my bride if she had answered me that way. And here's why. Because I didn't want 80% of Susan. I didn't want 80% of her. The day she became my bride, I wanted 100% of her heart. That's what I wanted. We, and you can, you can, pull, you can pull this down. We are to be the bride of Christ. And, and Christ, he will take each and every one of us with all of our imperfections. He'll take us just as we are. And then, you know, he'll take us as we are and, and, and as we seek him and as we find him and as we know him and he knows us. He'll, he'll work on us and he'll begin to clean us up. And he'll begin to sanctify you and to make you into the person that he wants you to be and you're destined to be. But the one thing he won't do, he won't take 80% of you. You got to give him 100%, 100% of your heart. You know, I talked about uh, Brother Al Terrell earlier. And it wasn't too long ago that Brother Al Terrell stood in this pulpit and he said, 99 and a half percent just won't do when it comes to the Lord. He wants a hundred percent of you. And also, if you really want to unlock something better, if you want to unlock something more in your life, if you want to guarantee your salvation, he's given us, he's given us the key to seek him with all of our hearts. And when you do this, you'll find him. It's a guarantee in scripture. You'll find him. And when you find him, you'll know him. You'll get to know him and he'll get to know you and you'll love him and you'll have victory in your life like you've never had. What I'm about to say may sound extreme and radical, but it's true and it's backed up in in scripture but the reality is when it comes to our lives he will either be Lord of all or not Lord at all and there's no middle ground thank you Would you stand up, please? As we go into the invitation, I'd like for our pastors to come forward to be here to pray. But you don't have to pray with one of the pastors up front. You can just make your way to the altar. But I'm going to ask you a question. Are you seeking the Lord with all your heart? And, and I want to ask you this. If there is 1% of your life that's not surrendered to the Lord, you, you need to get on your knees at this altar. Just one percent. Come and bow down before the Lord. Leave it here at this altar. And when you leave this house today, know that you are seeking the Lord. It, it is a promise. You'll seek me and find me when you search for me with all of your heart. And, and, and I got to tell you, if you're holding on to something, that you shouldn't be holding on. And boy, does the Holy Spirit have a way of telling us when we're doing that. If you're holding on to something 
you shouldn't be holding on to. You're not seeking Him with all your heart. I'm going to pray and then we're going to sing and the altar is going to open. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for the word today. Thank you for using Kyle and speaking through him and delivering the truth. Father, move upon our hearts that we will be individually sold out to you, holding nothing back. Thank you for that blessed promise that we will find you and that you will find us. Lord, bless us now. And Father, I would add to that, if there's somebody here who's not even sure of their salvation, that today salvation will come to that individual. Lord, I pray now that you'll bless as we begin to sing and open this altar. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Don't wait on the singing if you need to come get on your knees. Thank you again for watching our message from River of Life. If this message has touched you today, or if you need someone to pray with, please contact our office at 850-926-1200 or email us at info at rolcrawfordville.com. We also want to encourage you to visit us Sunday mornings at 1030 or Wednesdays at 7 p.m. Please visit us at rolcrawfordville.com for more information and directions.